and the lab work gets done and that's how the routine goes the doctor walks in and he's holding on to the lab seat and says yeah well your numbers are are high again we're going to need chemotherapy and she looks at me and says i'm not doing that again the clothes i want at my funeral are at the top of that closet in the basement i am not doing this again yeah and I try to like, don't tell the oncologist this, don't, don't do this. Um, and we walk out of there and we're holding the pink slip and one hallway is to get her chemotherapy set up. Mm -hmm. And the other one is front door and she's emotional and I'm emotional. And she goes, if it was you, what would you do? I mean, it still makes me emotional today because yeah. there's been a handful of times in my medical career where I answered that question honestly. Yeah. Because it's not a place for a doctor to be honest. It's a place where you don't get sued and you follow the protocol and you got mm -hmm. a, you got a um, criteria that you're supposed to make sure matches what the patient has and you follow the rules like everybody else. And mm -hmm. I said, Mom, I'd walk out that front door and I'd do something called the ketogenic diet. I was so lucky uh, some time back to be in America at a conference all talking about low carbs and some amazing, amazing speakers. But one in particular, a Dr. Boz blew me away with her own story about how when her mother was suffering with cancer, how she approached it and how, as far as I'm concerned, she's pretty much reversed her mom's cancer and certainly saved her life. Uh, Dr. Boz, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me on. I'm so excited to, I think it's my first podcast in the, the UK. Yeah, bring it on. Fantastic. Well, hopefully by the end of today, we're going to have everybody that watches, rushes out and buys this book. Let's go straight in. I, I, I mean, I've read loads of health books, like hundreds. I probably read a health book every two or three days. And mm. there was one beautiful one in the UK called Fixing Dad, which was about a dad... Uh, that got type 2 diabetes and how the two sons fixed the dad. But this is about fixing mom and how you fixed your mom. Tell us the whole story, start wow. to finish. You know, that's a great, um, it is a love story. When people say, what's your book? In, which department should you put it in? Uh, I said, I don't know, faith, uh, love, <laughs> romance. <laughs> and they're like, no, I don't think any of that fits. <laughs> but what, what, um, what started out as a a journey, I'll, I'll go way back because I think it will help you and help your people. Uh, just noticed that um, uh, I need to fix one thing with my computer here before I keep going or it will uh, completely uh, yeah. distract me. There you go. And don't worry about that. We can edit afterwards. So that's fine. Perfect. So the, I'll tell you where the story best starts is when I was in the seventh grade. So the seventh grade, I am... Um, I have realized uh, that in my small little town of 800 people that I believed I was for sure not going to have to be a hog farmer's wife, because that's what everybody turned out to be in my small little town, as a farmer's wife, if I went to college. My parents hadn't gone to college. My mother and dad had gone to like trade schools, and no four-year colleges, but I was sure that if you went to college, you got off the farm. <laughs> and... We had one of these things called an assembly, and an assembly meant that K through 12 went to the gymnasium because, you know, K through 12 is in one building. Uh, and my class, which was 21, went and so did all the classrooms. And these two kids who are, they were the Adams family, and they had come back from college and they were going to give an assembly on how to pick a college and some of the things to talk about. And they spent this whole hour talking about things like which colleges in South Dakota and which which ones should you pick and fraternity and sorority and all this stuff. And I didn't hear one thing about a job. So this seventh grade, the pigtails says, can, can you tell me what's your job? I was the first question in the assembly and they are kind of looking at each other sideways. And well, then they say, well, we don't have one. Um, and they went on to say how they had majored in trumpet and clarinet or something in the arts and I had ridden my bike, I had rode my bike to school. So I'm riding my bike home. I'm pissed 
the, the, nobody told me this formula doesn't turn out if I go to college and I get off the farm and I get to the end of the driveway and I, the, our job, our drive was like a half mile long, but you're supposed to take the mail in for mom and dad. So I get the mail and in the mail is Time Magazine. And it, Time Magazine says something like job placements and satisfaction. So essentially the article said, if you get trained in this, what's the chances you're going to use it in your life? And what is the satisfaction? And so if you went to the top of both charts, if you went to medical school, you were like 90 something percent chance going to be in the medical field. Wow. And yeah. now this was 1985, <laughs> four maybe. Uh, and the job satisfaction when you were a doctor was really high. Okay. And so I am <laughs> no handed riding, the, reading this dang article, riding down the driveway. And I'd come in the house and I said to my dad, I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> And from the day I was born, he was praying for a boy, uh, but I was born and he had me. <laughs> so this uh, strong headed, very stubborn young woman was now saying, I'm going to be a doctor. And I didn't even know what that meant. I mean, I, I knew Time Magazine. I had no mentors that were doctors. I just, oh God, please don't make me be a farmer's wife. Please don't make me be a wife. <laughs> Nothing wrong with farmer's wives. It just wasn't for you. Well, the, yeah, when I'm in medical, well, I'm in college trying to figure out that medical school stuff <laughs> turns out to be really hard to get into. And all my friends are, are partying. Uh, I would get up to leave my spot in the library. <laughs> it was my spot and I could smell hogs like to haunt me. Like you have a choice. You can either do really good right now, or you can go be a farmer's wife again. And I honestly, I've spent many years trying to get my children exposed to all the things that I didn't know were so great about being a, from a farm. But in the meantime, I was hell bent that I was going to get off the farm. And, you know, you you spend this energy and time. But what some of the accidental lessons that I had as a growing up was I was from this really small town where my mother was kind of like the unelected mayor. She just she was the Sunday school superintendent. Uh, she was the she coordinated the parade and she worked at the courthouse and she, you know, went to the school board. I mean you don't have a small town that's alive unless you show up and do things. And so that's just what you're supposed to do. And so this sense of community and responsibility in your community was, I mean, beyond palpable for me as a child. This is just what you did. And, and then, you know, small towns, you know, everything about them. You don't just know what their names are, but you know, you know, who's married, married to who and who's, uh, related to and what diseases are running in that family and who's sleeping with a neighbor. I mean, you know everything about these small towns. They're just small and connected, but they are these real relationships that um, have really come back to help me write that book. Because as I went through my career, I tried to find what, do I, what kind of doctor do you want to be? I remember this question. I was in medical school or two years in and you got to apply to residencies and the residencies all have a flavor of what kind of doctor you're going to be. And I'm just barely figuring out what it means to be a doctor. <laughs> and so I'm like, a good one? I want to be a good one. <laughs> and so I'm asking all my classmates and how they're making this decision. And of course, how you score on these tests matters a lot. So, um, and I, I mean, I really, I mean, I really prayed, like, how do I make this decision? It seems so out of my league to figure out what kind of doctor you want to be when I haven't even sampled what all of them do. And I mean, I felt this calling to say, where do I get the best joy, even out of being a medical student? And it was when I could answer the questions that my parents would ask me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just a little sprinkle, it was a deep dive into answering their questions. And when I realized who I was, you know, echoing, who was I copying the answer for and taking to my parents, it was internal medicine. So I head off to the world to be an internist and I move far away from mom and dad and life goes on and kids come and go. And, uh, and then one awful um, Christmas season, um, my mother gets sent to the hospital and she is in the hospital on New Year's Eve and I'm in, I'm a thousand miles away. Um, and she gets diagnosed with cancer and the pathologist um, you know, this, this hospital was 30 miles away from our little farm, but um, he personally calls me to tell me 
before I tell your mom. I need you to know what this says. And these white blood cells, it's a cancer that it's gonna, it's gonna take her life eventually. Uh, it's gonna plague her health in a way that, I, I mean, I, I needed one look at that slide to know what it was. And the most dangerous part about her journey over the next 20 years isn't so much that the cancer will kill her. It's that what the other doctors are gonna do is they're gonna forget about it because it's this slow growing cancer. Mm -hmm. And it was at that moment that I put in my resignation for where we were at. We were moving back to South Dakota and I was going to be a doctor near my mom. Right. And I set up shop in a small town, you know, in South Dakota. And I become a doctor in that town. And uh, within a couple of years, decide I, I think I want my own clinic. Um, and all of those journeys lead to I want to make sure that uh, whenever she gets care, I can if nothing else, know the doctor, but more importantly, be able to watch over her care because it was my favorite patient. It was the most important patient to me was this woman who had, I mean, she showed me what, what does it look like to be not just a great mom, but a, she was Mary Poppins to that little town. She just made it come alive. Yeah, I, I love the fact throughout the book you refer to your mom as Mary Poppins. I love it. It just... <laughs> When, when, I mean, whenever we do these podcasts, we put a title on afterwards and we, we'll bounce off some that we're thinking of, but one of them's got Mary Poppins in, in it and, oh. and the other one just goes straight into reversing my mom's cancer. But we'll, we'll chat about what the title should be afterwards. But um, <laughs> so, so you've moved back home uh, to be near your mom and the, the book goes into beautiful detail about the, the steps and the process and the learnings as you try different things. Um, let's start at the beginning of that journey then as you then start to go, well, okay, the bits I haven't learned in med school around this, what can I discover? And let's, let's talk a, a little bit about maybe the Navy SEALs and, and, and kids with the, uh, 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 epilepsy and things like that, that, that sparked thought in, in, in your brain. Right. So uh, at this time I had that old, my own clinic. And it, if you could say, it says internal medicine at the top, but really the tapestry of what goes on in that clinic was how do you get peak brain performance out of patients that have been coming from depression, anemia, Parkinson's, bipolar, um, you know, find a part where your brain's not working well. And um, that was probably the thread between all the patients in my clinic. That was what was attracted to my uh, my clinic outside the, you know, the establishment system in the, in the area. And um, when, and I was, I mean, I am a little competitive. So I was really proud that I did, I did New York style medicine in this little rural town of South Dakota. And, um, and I heard this podcast between Dom D'Agostino and Tim Ferriss where they were talking about peak brain performance and that's what got me to listen and they were doing a ton of things i was doing how do you get a brain to repair how, you know what happens during the injury you know tim ferris has this you know very um wonderful megaphone for what is what life looks like when your brain doesn't work right and different ways he's gotten back on track and fallen off again and so it's this wonderful conversation between this advanced scientist dom diagostino you know and and this patient who sounds eerily similar to all the patients that have come through my clinic. Mm -hmm. And I feel great about everything until they get to these words about ketones. And I'm a little like, <laughs> I mean, I'm arrogant actually, where I said, that has to be, that can't be true. I would know about it if it was true. I'm a doctor. And, I'd have been told about I mean, it. <laughs> I do. I'm great at this. I do a great job. <laughs> And so then I, 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 I mean, it's almost like I won't let myself look at it for almost a week after that podcast. I mean, he was talking about things like we use the Department of Defense uh, resources to you want to see one of our most expensive brains. It is a Navy SEAL. And God forbid they get an injury. And if we are doing any of the um, the most you know awful things that happen in the name of advanced brains, Navy SEALs and sciences, we have them do an underwater uh, scuba dive. And when we don't want bubbles to come up the top so the enemy can see them, these rebreathers change the pH of their body enough that they have a seizure underwater. Talk about a brain injury. And 
Um, and then they said, you know, none of these medications work. You have to use an advanced state of ketosis. And literally, I'm like, he must have misspoke. He means <laughs> ketoacidosis, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, and then the, I, I mean, it was a two and a half hour interview that I said, all right, I'm just going to sneak in the library and the med school library and just look this up a little. And oh my goodness, it opened this, just this I mean, it was, it was embarrassing, actually. Like, how does somebody who does this for a living in the place where, you know, the world is flat, I can get access to whatever information I need to. And sure, the Navy SEALs did some naughty things. And they hid it for a while, you know, some kind of crazy idea that it was a national security to keep their brains healing faster because my patients needed that information. And these Navy SEALs really had been through severe injury, trauma, physical trauma, chemical trauma. That's another major brain injury I would be taking care of. And um, their ketones uh, were, um, when they got them up to this certain level, and they used the word nutritional ketosis, which I had no idea what that meant at the time, um, that their seizures would stop. Like, and they could hold their breath longer and they could do things that were like science fiction. Like this isn't, you can't stop seizures with a, with a diet and you can't make your breath. You can't like make your oxygen carrying capacity longer if you are like on a certain diet. Yeah. And by golly, they were right. Yeah. So it's over those course of the next few months where I'm trying to figure out, well, how do I incorporate this into what I'm doing for my patients? Because, I mean, I can barely explain what a ketone was, let alone how to get in there. So I said, well, first, I'm going to I'm gonna pee ketones. And, oh, I did a terrible job. I couldn't pee a ketone to save my life. And by this time, <laughs> I've had three babies, and I'm probably, you know, 40 pounds overweight, like every doctor I know. And, um, and I just, I mean, like, it's almost like the science wasn't, yeah, I couldn't make it happen. I just couldn't make a ketone come out of me. And looking back now, I was very insulin resistant. My blood sugars were not terrible, but not great. And it was taking a lot of insulin for me to keep those blood sugars where they were. Uh, and we did, I took my three sons on a 21 mile hike on Memorial Day. And this is one month before that book starts. And okay. on Memorial Day, we hike around the city in the name of mental health for our soldiers. And at the end of that hike, I beat a ketone. Yay. And I'm like, <laughs> All right, we're there. And I'll, I, I say that all that journey because in the background of these last six months, what I didn't know I was preparing for was what was going to happen in the next month. Yeah. And I was coming across articles that are about cancer and how. Oh, the Warburg, you know, Warburg effect on cancer and metabolism was, well, if I was tested on it, I never, I don't remember it. Um, it just seemed all new, but it was coming out of a history book, mm -hmm. not out of a you know journal from last week. And so, and then my mom walks in to a, a doctor's appointment and I haven't seen her in a while. We live about a hundred miles apart, but I know that out of the last 52 weeks, she's been on antibiotics for 50 weeks <gasps> um, by this time of her journey she's been through chemotherapy twice oh. and the last time we took her through chemotherapy uh, her brain was so disconnected from the rest of her body that um even though she'd made every piece of clothing i ever wore until i was 10 years old she couldn't tell me what a sewing machine did oh. and it took us six months to teach her how to get that skill back to wake up those memories to heal that brain yeah and we did it but it was awful yeah. So when I meet her at my friend, my friend is the oncologist. We walk in and I know she's going to get blood tests right before. And I know that she's been very quiet the last two months, like not talking to me. And life's busy. Maybe that's what it is. But when she walks through the door and she's a, she's gray. She's not alive. She's like. She's overweight. She's got I mean, I can see the lymph nodes in her neck. I don't need to do a physical exam. Mm -hmm. Her chronic lymphocytic leukemia just got nodes and the lab work gets done and that's how the routine goes the doctor walks in and he's holding on to the lab seat and says yeah well your numbers are are high again we're going to need chemotherapy 
And she looks at me and says, I'm not doing that again. The clothes I want at my funeral are at the top of that closet in the basement. I am not doing this again. Yeah. And I try to like, don't tell the oncologist this, don't, don't do this. Um, and we walk out of there and we're holding the pink slip. And one hallway is to get her chemotherapy set up. Mm-hmm. And the other one is front door. And she's emotional and I'm emotional. And she goes, if it was you, what would you do? I mean, it still makes me emotional today because yeah. there's been a handful of times in my medical career where I answered that question honestly. Yeah. Because it's not a place for a doctor to be honest. It's a place where you don't get sued and you follow the protocol and you got mm-hmm. a, you got a um, criteria that you're supposed to make sure matches what the patient has and you follow the rules like everybody else. And mm-hmm. I said, Mom, I'd walk out that front door and I'd do something called the ketogenic diet. And she didn't know what a ketone was either, mm-hmm. but she was so stinking happy. I didn't say chemotherapy. Yeah. And at this stage of her cancer, um, doubling rates um, are what kill you, or that's the timer for how long you're going to make it. Yeah. So if you've got um, a certain, if you've got 50,000, uh, how long it takes you to go to 100,000 of those abnormal cells yeah. is the rate. And if you get to six weeks, if you got a doubling rate at six weeks, we got to give you chemo. We got to shut this down. We got to try again. We got to wipe the slate clean again. No matter what it does to the system, we got to wipe you down again. And the last two times that we've hit that doubling rate, we were able to get it down by about, you know, about 25% less. So 75% is, you know, it, it was still there. But so it was a so lot slow of, growing. A lot of chemotherapy for a smallish gain because you're not really, this, this is about a percentage of, the, 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 you know, in the bone marrow, that the percentage of the bad, the bad cells to the good cells, and it's doubling, doubling every, over these periods, but you're only taking it down a little bit, so you're just, you're not fixing the problem, you're just delaying it getting worse, right. I guess. Exactly. I mean, because they don't have a way to kill this one. I mean, it's a, there's a mistake happening, and it keeps happening, and that's where the cancer is coming from. And we can just kind of wipe out most of its roots, but we cannot take out the whole thing. It doesn't work that way. Um, so I, I said, I had done just enough reading to know she has a whole bunch of reasons why the cancer is growing. Um, but I had no evidence. I couldn't find one stinking article about chronic lymphocytic leukemia. I knew that my mom looked like a zombie and that if there was one little spark of Mary Poppins left in her, I couldn't find it. And my kids didn't know what that looked like either. Because now we've been living in South Dakota for 10 years. And I mean, it took almost seven years to get to the first chemotherapy round. And then it took another about two and a half years to get to the second round of chemotherapy. And now it's only a year and a half later. And so that's how quickly, once you get to the stage, you're playing a game of time and how can you swat down and give yourself some time. So, so it's growing, growing, my growing, car. and you've told mom, not with the doctor hat on, but with the lovely, caring, passionate daughter, let's walk out the door and let me tell you a little bit about something called the ketogenic diet. Right. So we're driving to the farm, which is this like 100 mile drive of flatlands and sunsets. And I left my car at the hospital. I just said, just get in the car. Let's do this together. And we're driving to the farm and I explain what a ketone is and what a carbohydrate is and how, well, the whole damn house is full of carbohydrates, mom. We're going to have to like, just throw them out. It's going to be hard, but I need you to not eat a stinking carb between now and the time you see the doctor again. And <laughs> she's like, what else is there? <laughs> like, well, there's fat. <laughs> so um, we... We went, I mean, the boxes of food that we took out of there, the, I mean, she'd been canning pantry with all things gooey and good, goodness for 40 years. And we just threw them away. Just, Mom, you can't have it around. I can't have you doing it. I can't have dad sneaking it. We're going to do this together, but we got one shot to get this right. And I've never done this with a patient before. I've just read a bunch of stuff and I was doing it for brains, not cancer, by the way. So we make a pack, um, 
get the house cleaned out. My husband drives to the farm, gets me in on the way back to our home. He said, what's going on? I said, either I'm killing her or I'm saving her. I'm not sure which. Yeah. Because there's, no, there's, no there's, no, there's no sort of protocol you can follow because it's all new. Yeah. Yeah. So she, we have her, you know, ketones and um, pee strips and I have mine and, you know, we are, we take pictures of it and send it to each other in the morning that this is what we've got. And, you know, I tell her, I'll do it with you. Our whole house will go keto with you, even though we're not living with you, we will do this too. So my little kids, all cereal goes out the door, everything in the house becomes keto. In the name of Grandma Rose, uh, we are all going keto to help Grandma. And um, there's a little bit of psychology in that, that when she sees her <laughs> grandkids doing it, when she sees everybody else saying, no, uh, it isn't going to work if we do it halfway. I need you to actually be in a state of ketosis. And that's the only thing I can bank on is here we go. Yeah. And so I knew a couple weeks later that something must be better. Again, I hadn't seen her. We live, um, but she hadn't called the clinic to get any antibiotics wow. and so i thought well, maybe she had some you know stuff to away from 1984 you know <laughs> like was there maybe some old ones in the house maybe that's what it is but um she didn't actually she took antibiotics for about five days is what i learned later and then she just ran out and thought okay i'll wait for the infections to come back and as you might say, guess when you have an infection of cancer cells or of white blood cells cancer infections are one way uh when you have cancer of white blood cells infections are just one of those canary in the cave like how are things going i don't know for a year you've needed antibiotics mom what do you think mm. um and now we are on like week five and we follow up at week six after supposed to be these several rounds of chemo mm -hmm. in the state of south dakota mm -hmm. we're spread out really thin so it was always be, being done at a remote hospital not anything close to the one where she would come to see my friend the oncologist so he was never going to know or see her if she was going for those appointments, but indeed she hadn't. So now she shows back up for this appointment and I meet her at the door and we walk in. And the first thing I know when she walks through that door is, oh, wow, she's not gray. There's Beautiful. help. I mean, there's something your brain says about healthy versus not healthy. And you don't need to be a doctor to see it. She was yeah. not gray. Wow. And and then she had her energy back. She was her, you know, she, when she gets nervous, she sings. And so she was humming a little tune and doing her thing. I'm like, oh, look at that. I haven't seen that in a while. And we get her blood drawn and uh, we sit in the doctor's office or in the exam room. And, and the phlebotomist comes up to draw it again. And I said, oh, did it, did it clot? Did, Nope, just need to recheck it. Yeah, I need to recheck it. Maybe, so I, maybe we've cross-labeled the uh, the test tube with somebody else by mistake. This can't be happening. Let's do it again. Right. This can't be right. So, right, it's totally what's happening. And I'm thinking, oh, either it's really good or it's really bad. But in my heart, I just know something's good because of the way she looks. And mm. she, he walks in and I can hear him saying, well, call them. I can't find the records anywhere. And so he walks in the door and because he's looking for where's the chemo records, right? Yeah. Look at how much better it is. It must be chemo that did this. And he goes, well, um, right before he walks in, I look, I, I kind of freak out saying, okay, mom, if he asks any questions, just shut up. I don't know how to explain this. I'm sure <laughs> that I just, just don't get me in trouble. Just stop speaking. <laughs> It's just going to give her a lot of confidence, right? Yes. Yeah. So my, he walks in and you can hear him barking at the nurses. Like, well, find the records because, you know, clearly she had chemo. What else could have done this, right? He's not saying those words, but that's what I put together as you listen from the other side. And he goes, well, um, what have you been doing? Uh, and she goes, oh, you know, just some fresh air from the farm. <laughs> You're hilarious. Uh, he goes, well, how did the chemo go? And she goes, I didn't go. Well, how did how'd you get, I mean, at this point I'm saying, well, if the if it didn't double, 
it just like increased by 50% or maybe, maybe increased by, you know, 40%. It's a win. It's a wave. It's a win. But I had no space when the words came out of his mouth that he says, well, then how did you lower your numbers by 70%? <sighs> and I mean, it's such a shift of where, like of possibilities. Yeah. And I thought, oh, and we did the, we did the sloppiest version of it. I mean, we were in ketosis, but I mean, we, neither of us lost a pound. We were eating so much fat. I mean, we were pooping fat. We were eating like way too much. But at the same time, she felt so good. Um, I mean, for the first time in, a, in at least five years, she had energy. She had this sparkle in her eye. She had the Mary Poppins look that I had been, that I thought was dead. Wow, and... just fascinating. Just, I mean, you know, you're expecting those cells to just grow and grow and grow, the chemo to, you know, bring it back down a little bit, but accepting the fact that there'll have to be another round of chemo because, yeah, they double and double over a period. You're just trying to, you know, with chemo, reduce or lengthen the time before, it, you know, it, it doubles again. You've refused, well, your mom's refused the chemo because it was your mom's call at the end of the day. Your mom's refused it. And it's gone back. You haven't, you haven't just held it. What, like drugs, best normally most drugs for most metabolic and chronic illnesses are just trying to maintain, let alone improve. But you've just changed the diet in a significant way. And obviously a lot of yeah. uh, your mom being strict to it because she hasn't half done it. She's properly done it with that great support of your family because when you try and do it on your own, it might be a bit hard. But the fact mm -hmm. that you all, I mean, it's just so beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. And he said, I'll see you in three months. I'm like first of all you're crazy to go you don't understand why i got better and now you're giving her the the three month follow-up you crazy doctor no make her come back sooner than that <laughs> but i, I didn't out her because i'm like maybe i'll figure it out but like i i gotta go learn about this more because she's asking me all these questions i i don't have enough cancer data to you know hardly right on the end of a, a pin drop uh I just have, you know, a few things from Adrian Schack, you know, a few things from Metabolic Health Summit that I hadn't met them yet. I hadn't even, I didn't know this, you know, the first Metabolic Health Summit is from Dom Diagostino is about to come up the next spring. And I was certainly going to be at that. Yeah. And that um, over the next, so that that's the first four chapters or five chapters of that book. And what happens over the next six months is um, is where it, it gets nitty gritty. Uh, you know, the first few chapters of that book, I'm very snarky about how this can't be a, a diet that works, and um, it, it must it must be a, another fad diet. I've seen enough of them to you know to know better that I would know about it, and that. It We've lost your microphone there, Annette. That were impressive to me was that um, there were the seizure patients, the you know the the ones who were in the accidental ketogenic arm that they didn't have Depakote work when they were kids with seizures. And I'm a brain. I mean, I do internal medicine, but peak brain performance is my thing. So if you want to see a riddled brain, give me a child seizure case that is now an adult, and you'll you'll just never hit peak potential because of all the damage that's done from those recurring seizures. So when I'm reading this data and they have, you know, mandatory compliance with the ketogenic diet because, well, they have a seizure if they go off of it. And this is in the 1950s where now you're going to watch these kids age and they don't, their seizures go away when they are in a ketogenic state. But as soon as they have some carbs, they pee their pants and fall on the floor. I mean, like, it's kind of not a subtle thing that you cheated. And their families were, at the time, admitted to the hospital to teach them how to get into ketosis. And um, they didn't have any fancy sugars. They just had a bunch of fat and a bunch, you know, protein and no carbs. I mean, essentially. And, and then these people aged. And they signed up for, we want to follow your, your body at autopsy. And... At this time I wrote the book, there was only a couple of people who had had a, these autopsies. So they'd aged all the way. And of course I wanted to read what was their brain like. Uh, mm. And their brains were, well, they were beautiful. I mean, I have brain envy of a seizure kid. 
No, that couldn't be. But not only did they have a lack of those neurofibril tangles that are known for the dementia uh, predictors of Alzheimer's, but there were other things that they were finding. Like, I mean, everybody has cancer a little bit. I mean, cancer is a mistake that's happening and then the mistake doesn't get corrected. And your body's designed not to make that mistake. But mm -hmm. if you run an autopsy and you look for cancer, there's cancer in everybody. Yeah. But they were like, we couldn't find that in these two cases. Now, it's just two cases, but the fact that it was none, I'm like, incredible. Huh. It's and incredible. Then, right. And let me just quickly explain those. Uh, and you, you got to buy the book because you explain it absolutely amazingly in there. And I'm only repeating what I've learned from the book. Basically, it, it was the 50s, the 60s. If you had seizures as a child, especially epilepsy seizures, you'd try this medication, that medication, you try the drugs first. But if the drugs didn't work, the only answer if the drugs didn't work was to go ketogenic. So we now have a number of people mm -hmm. that are doing the ketogenic diet uh, be, to stop the epilepsy. And then they go through their life as normal, eventually sadly pass away from other causes. You go to then a brain uh, uh, biopsy, you're looking the brain, you're expecting to see you know, a, a brain that's in a bit of a mess because every time you have an, 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 ep, an epileptic, epileptic fit, it makes it, the brain a little bit worse, a bit worse, a little bit worse. So we're expecting those sort of seizures in their 20s, 30s or teens. Now they've died at 50, 60 of another cause. We're expecting to see a messy brain, but you look at those autopsies and you go clear. And not only are there no tangles that you would expect uh, relating to what happened in the past, zero cancer, which kind of nobody has zero cancer, and you're going, there must be something about the ketogenic diet then. If it can turn what should be a really scrambled up brain into a very clean brain, there's got to be something in this. Right. And the power of just continuing to, to, um, to be attracted to the puzzle of that, like, how is that? How is that? And just that, I mean, the hunger of, uh, of something I don't know about when it comes to the brain, like that kind of was like, I've got a lot of this figured out. Here's how you do this. And um, I mean, it, it really was this awakening in my practice where I had a whole branch of, of resources that I had I'd never tapped into. And, you know, when, when you've been in practice long enough, whenever a drug comes out and you're the first, you're a rapid adapter, you're somebody who does it first, the danger is that the drug then comes out and is hurting people. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, step one of using a modality, especially in your favorite patient, uh, that um, seems to have this really, like, inappropriate success. Like, how can you have, I mean, it's like snake oil. It was making all these things better. Um, but what you wanted first evidence for is that what, it wasn't going to hurt somebody. So when you happen to have these long studies of, oh, they're kids. They're kids with seizures. And they, no, they didn't have early heart attacks. They didn't have, uh, well, they didn't have dementia. Um, and that, that, that confidence that at least you weren't hurting them. And there is something that's, that's unanswerable here, at least in 2014 and 2015, when I was writing that book, uh, like, wow, that's impressive. Mm. And I think, you know, that it, it really fueled a hope that, wow, there's a part of this that I don't need to use some of these medications for. And, and so I, that's where the sticky notes came from, where at this point, I have no intentions of ever writing a book. I think that's for other people to do, not me. Um, but around my house, I was leaving sticky notes because I got through the first month without killing my mother and without being like reported to a medical board by my <laughs> colleague who's looking at me like, what the hell is she doing? I'm, like, I'm with her going, to see you later. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I have these little stickies like, okay, how can I, because as much as my mother's better, she is not the spry version of herself that, um, that unfolds by the end of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a process that um, she's getting better, but it's easy to overwhelm her. It's easy to mm -hmm. overwhelm, I mean, anybody at 71 when you're fighting off cancer and now you're not, you're doing better. And she does what a lot of people do. And that is that she wasn't so good at keto for a while. Mm -hmm. Like oh, I did that. It's okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And then the complications that come next and how 
I seem to have this new pet project of finding everything out I can about the ketogenic diet. And I don't tell her most of it because she's okay. You know, don't push her too hard. She's all right. And then you know, as that book unfolds, she gets very sick. And then we did some, yeah, very impressive things of, thank God I kept reading. <laughs> thank God I didn't have to learn all of it in the hallways of the hospital. And, and in the end, I thought 12 people would read that book. I wrote it because, I mean, in part, she was recovering from what was the edge of life. And you get to those moments and think, well, I get another chance yeah. to, to help her. And, and then I lost this bet with my husband who said, you need to put this in the book. You need to put this in the book. <laughs> and so when I pushed publish on that book, I expected a dozen people to buy it. And it has sold over 150,000 copies. Oh, it's just been a miracle. Well, yeah. it, it's a beautiful book and 150,000 copies is not enough. Everybody needs to read this book, not just for cancer, but for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's, for, for so many different reasons. My mum's my, my, my got Alzheimer's, I've got the APOE4 gene. Uh, and, and, you know, I've teetered on the edge of ketogenesis for, for quite a while. Uh, I've done some mad scientific events where I've cycled 500 miles in five days with zero calories. So you're completely in ketosis and the brain is clearer than ever before. You're seeing colours you've never seen before and, and, and life is just brilliant. But then, like your mom did, you slip back into, oh... I'm out for dinner. I'll just have a bit of that. And then, and then you, you, you either do the breath test the next day or take a blood prick or you pee on the stick and it's not turned pink. And you go, why have I done that? And in fact, you, there's two things at the conference and in your book. Because uh, my downfall is, I, I mean, I, I, I exercise a lot. I eat quite well, but I drink way too much wine. Uh, and, and there's two reasons why you've taught me I need to cut the wine down. One is because whenever you're drinking that wine and you've got wine in the system and the liver's trying to deal with it, that kicks you out of ketosis. Well, I need to stay in ketosis more. That therapeutic or whatever that is, one to two, MMR, whatever it is. I need to stay in that for more because I'm very susceptible to uh, uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, that's, that's the first thing that you convinced me. But then, as we'll probably get onto in another podcast, the brain scan that you showed of somebody, what happens for the next few days as, as they had a glass of wine. So, uh, you, you know, we, we do slip in and out of it occasionally, but thanks to you, I've got two reasons to try and stay in it. <laughs> the same reason, actually, but uh, for a lot, lot longer. Oh. And, and, right. and, the, and the one thing I love, and everybody always tells me not to oversimplify stuff, but sadly I've lost uh, two grandmothers. I've lost uh, a grandfather, my auntie at just 55 to cancer. My kid's piano teacher died of cancer at 34 and their first nanny died at 24 for a cancer. So, and we've all got the same stories. Oh, we're surrounded by yeah. people that, you know, sadly have died way too young of cancer. But I always get told off for oversimplifying it. Uh, and, 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 and I say, look, you go into a PET scan and you, you know what a PET scan is. And I talk to people, I go, look, they inject you with that blue dye. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what the blue dye is? The blue dye is actually glucose because... The glucose goes to where the cancer is because cancer loves sugar. It doesn't necessarily thrive on ketones, or in fact, we don't think they use ketones at all, but it loves sugar. So if you're trying to avoid cancer, surely the thing you want to cut down is your sugar because we know that they feeds on it. But I always then get told by all my doctor friends, of course, you must stop there, Steve, because that's, once somebody's got cancer, then you're way out of your league and just shut up because we don't even know if that's relevant. But you, you've got a true story there, your own story, yeah. that, that, that moving the body from burning glucose and sugar and carbs to moving it to ketones, I don't know what, I'm not, I'm not putting words in your mouth, mm -hmm. but maybe, maybe starve the cancer, well, I don't know. Yeah, I've used that word. Uh, I get a lot of pushback from, a few, from the PhDs of the world when I do starve cancer, but I think that's got some, uh, still has a great teachable um, subtext about why that is still a very good place where it makes it a lot harder for that cancer to survive. Yeah. Uh, so I'll tell you what happens after that book comes out, though. Um, and that is that I had this sleepy little clinic in the middle of nowhere <laughs> that took care of brains. And um, I was just fine doing exactly that. But now I have people calling uh, who've read the book. And it's actually on audiobook as well. That, so that, uh, mainly because most people like my mom at the beginning of their 
injuries, and even if it's not a cancer injury, uh, a metabolic injury, they, they can't read very well. I mean, she's a lovely reader when she was healthy, but as the brain gets harder and harder to focus, uh, to read something is actually a higher tax on their brain than just mm -hmm. to listen. And it's also one of the reasons I continue to try and when I give a lecture or when I try to be asked to speak to teach in stories so that their brain will capture it and remember it to link it to a story. And as I uh, set, you know, put this out there and it, you know, you get paid like three months when you're a, when you're in a um, self-published, if you push it on Amazon and say, go publish yourself book, um, it, you don't get dividends for three and four months afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it's months later where I get this, check in the mail in my email saying you know 48,000 people bought your book wow. and I'm like how so it becomes this uh they become aware of it the world does whatever and um in the meantime I had had a few patients that had come to me in the community about this and I was really tired of explaining a ketone mm -hmm. and so I had taken the chapters of the book and just said, all right, I'll put them on YouTube. You know, I'll put them on YouTube. And you can't come see me again until you watch this playlist on YouTube. Because mm -hmm. they don't pay me to spend two hours teaching what a ketone is. And about the 10th time I've done that, I'm going to, I'm losing <laughs> myself. Like, oh my goodness, I'm not doing this again. So I say, fill out this worksheet. You'll, you'll know it's time to come see me because you'll be done with those 10 little videos. Mm -hmm. And so I was putting out these little videos that were super cheesy, but I didn't care. It was short and my patients would watch it. And that's who I was doing it for. And um, by golly, uh, that took off too. Mm -hmm. And one day where I'm sitting in my, uh, I now have rules in my clinic that nobody can come become my patient if they're calling, they're asking about a ketone. I'm one person, we have, you know, a small staff. I, I, I have the, the clinic is like booked out for a year and a half new patients. Like what, why? <laughs> I mean, you don't need me to do a ketogenic diet. And um, so I am in line to pick up my son from middle school and it's February in South Dakota about, you know, wind chill 30 below zero, it's really cold out. And this woman takes that book and she shoves it up to my, uh, my windshield and she looks around it and said, did you write this book? <laughs> And I'm like, oh, so it's, I can't roll down the window. So I said, get in. So she gets in my car and she is asking me, do you know what your colleagues fed me when I was in the hospital and they took out my colon cancer? Do you know what they fed me? I'm like, cops. <laughs> no, what did they feed you? Pudding. They fed me pudding. And I'm like, and she's like so serious. And she goes, and your staff, they are, they are like police dogs. I cannot get in to see you. I'm thinking I need to pay them more. I need to pay them more. <laughs> but I said, well, who's your doctor? And she lists off like eight of her doctors. And I'm like, well, I know them. They're great doctors. You don't need to see me to not eat pudding. Uh, you, you don't need to see me besides I am one little clinic. <laughs> and then she's pushing back. If you've ever argued with a Brazilian woman, you'll know the, what this, how the story ends before I start. And she then says something to me that strikes so close to Grandma Rose that I couldn't make my vocal cords say no. She said, well, then you need to start a support group and I'll be your first student. <laughs> And it actually just gives me goosebumps to think of the moment that I said, oh, that would work. Yeah. Because it's difficult. I'm a little clinic and I make money when I do the things that insurance companies approve of, which is yeah. prescriptions and orders and tests and advice. And uh, the number I see in a day is not something I like to brag about because you have to do that to pay the bills. That's true. Um, but That's where true. I really find myself alive is when I get asked to speak when I have a local church group saying our addicts are suffering and we know you take care of these brains, will you come give us a brain lecture? And I'd rather do that for free all day long because mm -hmm. of how much joy it would give me. Yeah. And so I'm in this, I said, all right, we'll, we'll do Friday mornings at eight o'clock. I'll be there for an hour. And by golly, she showed up 
And the person that I wrote the next book about uh, shows up that first day and he never missed an, a support group. And these were, you know, <laughs> folding chairs, cold load. There's no heat on in the in the basement of where I rent my clinic. Uh, there was an unrented place. And I, you know, I, the guy didn't even get the heat turned on before I had the first support meeting where we're sitting there in our coats in the middle of winter, watching our breath, uh, saying, all right. This is a support group. Here's how these work. And and people drove for miles to come and ask questions about the ketogenic diet. And we, we wouldn't let them be a patient until they'd come to at least five support groups. Because the truth is, you probably don't need to see me. You just need to hear, you need to get your questions answered. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that protocol of what I was doing in the clinic, because every, every patient now had a reason for me to be checking things, to be looking at their numbers, to be chasing how can I get them off of these medicines? How can I give to them what I did to my mother? Mm -hmm. And it is a, it is not take a doctor. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's, it was nice for my mom. But I, I mean, I can say that because I've done enough of these where um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of safety in, in how well this works for so many things. Sure. Uh, but the beauty is those kids from the seizures and again, the amount of data the Navy SEALs had from what Dom and his team had looked at were, oh, the safety was easy to show. As long if you're in ketosis and you're here and I'm looking at most of the things your blood work wants me to look at, safety was not going to be the problem. Sure. Teaching people how to stick to it was what I thought. I mean, that's where I think the real puzzle has turned out to be. Yeah. And um you know, what I what I feel like I bring to the table for helping, hopefully, before I quit this job of being a non hog farmer's wife, <laughs> I can get get the the freedom of of getting people off of these prescription medications mm -hmm. that are truly caused by a me metabolic problem about the way you eat. Yeah. And I think if if you're watching to see how how do you really transform somebody um, from a overweight brain fog, autoimmune, um, cancer growing, pre-diabetic, um, frequently depressed addict, mm -hmm. um, all of those in one patient. Yeah. And the answer is still 20 total carbohydrates or less and pee on a ketone step. Uh, I mean, that's where you start. Yeah. Where sad and sadly, the, I think the answer at the moment is multiple medications, you know, 10, 15, chronic illness medications to uh, I mean, the, 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 that is sadly still the prescribed approach and yet you've just named lots of things that are all you know around the food we eat and trying to go back to basics right. of what the human diet what we're supposed to thrive on and so on and so forth and, and a couple of questions that just spring to mind from your, your your groups that you're running first of all how long have you been doing those groups now so I started in 2015 when that book was recorded and I have missed uh, two, two weeks. Oh, wow. And I, I, so I, seven years. I, and just say no if you want to say no, but obviously your mom's story is fantastic. Are, are you now hearing other stories from other people with similar stories based on the change in diet? Oh yeah, that's the beauty of, you know, they, they do fly across the country and t try to see me despite having some pretty good guardrails, um, <laughs> but they come to the group uh, and the, the group is actually more fun because it sh they shouldn't just be telling the story to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the beauties of, I mean, I do think God puts you on a plan and if, as long as you don't fight him uh, too much and you kind of just say, here's where I'm meant to be, yeah. um, the, 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 grace of doing something powerful happens. And yeah. I really believe that. Uh, I didn't want to be an addiction doctor. I wanted mm -hmm. to be a good brain doctor. Mm -hmm. But it turns out addiction was a, one of the avenues where you could pay the bills and it would have a place of I'm repairing their brain, but I'm also working on their addiction. And so part of the clinic that I ran for, you know, 15 years was um, how do you repair their um, addiction? Okay, which is not a prescription. It has everything to do with your, you know, home of origin and, how, you know, your vices and what happened to your brain and your hippocampus at the age of 12. I mean, really great neuroscience, but it, there's a lot of psychology and a lot of community um, in how do you get them better. Mm -hmm. So 20 years of doing that, or, you know, of working on brains, but actually the, the addiction clinic was about 10 years uh, uh, of perfecting. How do you really get them out of this ditch? 
And we used to have a sign that you would leave the nurse's den to go into the, the where the patients were and right above the door said, don't let them get addicted to us. Oh, nice. And it's truly an issue. Yeah, truly an nice. issue with addiction when they're free and they then think it's us. They think we're the good guys and we're the reason they're better. And, you know, really transferring that success and that responsibility back to the patient is mm -hmm. how you get them free. Don't, mm -hmm. don't, it's not us that did this. Yeah. And I just yeah. find that journey as was preparing me for, I mean, carbs are addicting. That's not a question. That's a very good fact. Yeah. And when they have these chronic yeah. diseases, they've been using that carbohydrate rescue uh, to dissociate from, you know, other pains and other places of neglect in their life. Well, we'll, we'll definitely do another podcast the... on, on the brain because your oh, slides okay. that you showed at the conference just blew me away. I, I just want to come back to, to your groups and, and the knowledge and mom, uh, uh, Rose and Mary Poppins. Um, and you just said, you said the word earlier on nutritional ketosis and we heard at the conference different people saying different things. And I appreciate that we're all individuals and therefore you can't say it's the same for everybody. And I appreciate we can never give medical advice but what are you aiming for? One MMO, two MMO, somewhere in between the two, more, less, or are we all different? And therefore, you know, when, when I'm keying on that, when I'm peeing on my stick or with the breath or, 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 or pricking the finger uh, and I'm taking, I know you, you have a, your own range of uh, exogenous ketones and so on and so forth. What are, what are, we, what are we aiming for? What are we shooting for? Right. So uh, again, I was that internal medicine physician that likes the data and the really deep dive into some answers, right? So when I got to the part of the, well, what does it take to keep a brain from having a seizure? Uh, what does it take to keep that brain aging in a way that didn't, well, reverse, but also that that didn't have the, the neurofibril tangles? And the answer was you couldn't let the glucose get too high and you needed the ketones to be flexible, available for surge when mm -hmm. when needed. Uh, so the word that has recently been in vogue is metabolically flexible. Okay, mm -hmm. we can use that word. Uh, but also you should be able to measure uh, what what is the conversation in your body relative to insulin, glucose, and ketones. What's that doing? And when I was trying to help my mom, because in this later part of the book, she gets very sick and we needed to calculate things. We needed to really be specific about how we were going to get from this side of a mess to that side of a mess. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking mm -hmm. her swollen older brain that has not been in ketosis forever uh, to do some math, like take that European number and turn American number, turn it to a European number, then divide to get to a millimole of one so that one to Okay, it was way too much for my mother. Sure. I said, all right, mom, take the big number, the glucose, and divide by the little number, the ketone. And we're going to call that this ratio. And since then, it's been, I didn't come up with this, but it worked, the Dr. Boz ratio. Mm -hmm. And it's what I call, it's messy math. The, the, the units don't cross, cross out. It, 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 every math teacher is going to cringe when they look at it. <laughs> but it's simple. In that um, if you are looking for people who are trying to lose weight, that uh, Dr. Boss ratio should at least be less than 100 and I would push you below 80. Mm -hmm. And that is a one to four <laughs> ratio on your GKI. Okay. When I'm taking care of more advanced problems like the um, autoimmune disorders or um, even a brain injury that's in the chronic stages, uh, not in the acute stages, um, I'm gonna get a Dr. Boss ratio of 40 or less. And that is a GKI of two. Mm -hmm. one. But when I'm taking care of the most advanced patients, where it's the um, where it's a seizure patient, it's a cancer patient, or it's an acute brain injury, then I'm going to be a Dr. Boz ratio of less than 20, which is a wow. GKI of one to one. And it is in those progressions that um, the best way to do that is your own metabolism. Mm -hmm. That when we look at what supplements do, they are a great place where you came into me way too sick and we have cancer growing everywhere. Your chemo's next week. I need you to get to these numbers if you're going to ha have success at, at what you're trying to do. Uh, that's a rare state. I don't usually, I, th I mean, I think those are not the places to be throwing a whole bunch of things at these people. They're fighting for their life. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they need, 
that, that's a different story. Sure. Um, but when I look at um, the places where exogenous ketones have been, are being studied and continue to be studied, it is how do I let them not slide all the way back into the ditch when they're in a season where they're not practicing ketosis as well, mm -hmm. but I can't afford for them to start all the way over. I need you to remind yourselves what a ketone looks like at least a few times a week. And then when you get your game on, you aren't going to need these supplements. But it is also a similar thing that I saw again and again and again and again when addiction would hit their brains and they would do well for a while and then they crash. Mm -hmm. And it's just like that that bike ride where you you have a great sense of your health and clarity and why in the world wouldn't you stay there? until your mother's the one handing you the good stuff. And there's all kinds of like history and guilt and, uh, you know, paternalism that you're like, okay, of course I'm going to eat it for my mother. <laughs> and then you're off uh, to a slip here, a slip there. And suddenly you're no longer in even nutritional ketosis. Yeah. And although you're young and healthy, I mean, you're healthy and not 75 with cancer. Um, if they go six months without seeing a ketone again, we got to start all over. And yeah. Yeah. What I've learned is if you can give them a little hope to say, no, no, just take the supplements. If you're in a, if you're in a sucky place, just to hang in there. Yeah. And then remember that support group I yeah. told you was really important. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. You need a support group. And um, there's a reason AA has continued to be such a successful place for people to land is yeah. that it is free. It is a bunch of people working on the same problem and they show up saying, I screwed it up a little. Here's where I'm at. And yeah. that mentorship helps the one speaking and the one listening. And those are how, yeah. that's I mean, how brains heal. I mean, there's, there's two things, is there not? And correct me if, you, if I'm taking this wrong. There's, there's the addiction side of things for, for derailing your progress. There's also the social side of, well, I, I know I need to stay in ketosis for, 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 for different reasons. So mine, again, is worried about Alzheimer's and, and because I'm APOE4. But I've also just gone out with my kids last night and while I didn't have the bread and I didn't have the pizza, I did probably have some rice with the, the chicken curry or whatever, which I know I shouldn't have done. And normally I wouldn't, but I did last night and I wake up and pee on the stick or take my bloods and, you know, and I'm, you know, 0.5 as opposed to one. Well, taking one of, say, one of your supplements or anybody else's, you know, uh, uh, exogenous ketones just quickly gets me back to where I was. So, and again... I suppose that's also the danger in one sense. If you know you, there is a trick to get you back into it, you might be naughty more often. So we've got to say the best way is just to try and keep the diet really strict uh, and, and not rely on anything exog exogenously uh, taken, but, it, but, it, but it's there. Or like you say, leading up to uh, a, 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 you know, a, a medical situation uh, and then use it then. Um, that is phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, where else did I want to take your... Yes, kids in ketosis. So, I met your lovely oh. son uh, recently, who was a pleasure to be around. Uh, very sporty, I thought. Um, how do you find... Because I, I always say, you know, bringing up your kids, bringing up your parents is normally more difficult, but you did a very good job. I always say, I've got seven kids. So I always go, bringing up the kids, like, that's difficult. Oh. Bringing up my parents is impossible, but you, you, you're obviously very good at both. Um, <laughs> How do you keep your kids close to ketosis or near ketosis when there's so much temptation around? Because you don't strike me as a bossy, right, well, do this type mother. You, you, you must have a great motivation. How do you do it? I show them pictures of brains. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the beautiful part is, uh, I mean, I, I'll tell you one of my favorite lectures I, I gave was um, when I left the corporate medicine. I had just recently been to South Dakota uh, under a year, maybe under two years. And I had a non-compete. So I needed to either leave again, which I wasn't going to do, or find a way to journey for two years without going broke. So most people leave. And I'm in a room of a bunch of shiny shoes and white shirts and boys. And I said, there's got to be another option. Mm-hmm. And they leave the room and they come back in and says, Dr. Bosworth, you can see the poor and you can see Medicaid, which means living below the poverty level. And you can do that for two years. Um, so I did. I, start, I started in a shelter where it would be like foster care. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw these kids who were super smart, but their parents had 
lives that were upside down. And once a week, they were supposed to get a lecture on health. Mm -hmm. And what I learned is when the nurse didn't do a good job of that, it turned into 15 visits from me to me yeah. that I didn't need to, I got it done with one lecture in front of the room. And I gave this lecture, um, I, I crafted it to try and attract that, that wayward kid. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're in there, they've been drinking, they've been caught doing a crime or their parents are in jail. I mean, it's really, it's one crappy situation after the other. Yeah. And this lecture is what I would give to them. The punchline was you have a hippocampus in your brain right now. And the length and thickness of your hippocampus will decide who's going to be successful in this room. Mm -hmm. And there's evidence behind this. I didn't tell them all the evidence, but Michael Jordan was an example of a very long, thick, very well-developed hippocampus. Mm -hmm. Success is how do you get out of this situation? Mm -hmm. And if you want your hippocampus to grow, you cannot swell it. You cannot cause it to ha have swelling. And of course, as I'm practicing how to get this for these you know, folks in the shelter, I make my kids listen and mm -hmm. I show them the pictures. And I think that was the beginning of this conversation that's happened in our house for now 20 plus years of how do you get the best brain? And um, and so I, I think as much as I could just as easily be the mom that scolds and shames them for having carbohydrates, uh, what's more fun is to watch them uh, take the information about a, a brain and share it with some of their their friends. I'm going to ask uh, my producer, um, Connor, can we bring up some, we've got some of your pictures from your conference you did in the States. We'll try and pull a few up that are relevant. Oh, and I've got plenty of them too. Oh, you've got them there as well. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Great. I mean, uh, why don't we do that? Well, let, let's, let's, let's jump into that because it is fascinating. And like I say, the one you brought up about what alcohol mm -hmm. does to the brain, it's starting to have an effect. <laughs> and a combination of that and, and, and having that glass of wine kicking me out of ketosis. Uh, last week I was away skiing with the wife <laughs> and normally it would have been three or four glasses, but I had one or two and I calculated that's going to put me out of ketosis probably to about two in the morning. I thought, ah, oh, okay, I'll deal with that. Um, but, but it's definitely having an effect. And I also find, and I don't know whether this is true, but the more I'm in ketosis, because I'm quite an addictive person, I feel to be less addictive to things while I'm in ketosis. It seems to be that when my brain's running on sugars and the traditional diet, I seem to be more addictive to anything. Whereas mm -hmm. when I'm in ketosis, for some reason, my addictive personality seems to be less addictive. I don't know if that's a true thing or not. Oh, it's absolutely the place where you, uh, you can find that, that, uh, that hunger for, so I, I wonder if I can share my screen. Is that how this works here? Is that yeah. so you can see some of these? So let's use some of your brain images to show me how you showed those to obviously the people from the centers, but also your own children, showing them some of these brain images to get the message across probably better than, than any other way. Yeah, right. So um, I'm going to give these first four uh, images and okay. let you uh, take on uh, what, Oh, I got to push here. Um, sharing scaring has failed to start. Please try again later. Okay, Oops. hold on. Share. Okay, hold on. Maybe I'm doing, let me try one more way. I, 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 I chose a screen instead of a desktop. So there we now go. we got it, right? Cool. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So uh, again, I could give a 12 hour workshop on this. So you need to push, <laughs> you need to push stop. <laughs> this is my thing. So yeah, I like I love using spec scans. Uh, spec scans give they're pretty colors, um, mm -hmm. but when you're working with teenagers, uh, it's just, I mean, it, I'll tell you when you're working with um, youth pastors, <laughs> their attention is very short. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to be able to get the punchline to them really quickly, <laughs> or they 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 lose focus. So um, when I look at um, uh, this is what normal looks like okay. on a spec scan uh, that you'll see all around. There's, there's really beautiful colors and yep. it really looks like a nice looking brain. This is the, the same other part that the, I the, sorry to interrupt. This is the same brain from different angles, is it? Yes. And okay. so if you think of the pink yep. in eyeballs, it helps you to kind of orientate. So that one you're oh, looking okay. down on their brain. Yeah. And then this one, you're kind of looking over at the left side of their brain. And mm -hmm. this one you've kind of 
lift it up and you took it out of the skull and you're looking from the bottom side up. Okay. And then there's a tiny little bit of pink over there on that other one where you can see that's the, that will be the right side of their brain. Okay. But the colors don't mean anything except trying to orientate you on this glow because as beautiful as that activity is, um, when I'm teaching teenagers, I warn them that as you age, your brain starts to do things like, well, it ages. And if you watch uh, what activity is typical in a, a brain of aging, mm -hmm. there's that beautiful, and if, if you're in front of 12 year olds or teenagers, they think 30 is old, but I tell them, no, <laughs> that's, that's what a brain looks like at 30. Um, but I'm 50. And so right there, I tell them, well, this is what my brain looks like. And uh, I point out that little spot right there yeah. and say, you know, you guys, uh, you guys do long division. You know, that part yeah. where you take a big number and divide by the little one. Yeah. yeah well, um, if you, do you think I do long division during the day? Mm -hmm. And some people say, yes. I'm like, then you, you do not know me. I do not do long division during the day. I use a calculator. <laughs> But I'll tell you, the cells in my brain that know how to do long division, mm -hmm. well, they're there, but I haven't used them in 20 years because I use a calculator. Mm -hmm. um, and they go to sleep if you don't use them. I, so I, when just, you just look so, just at so I understand, my... uh, Dr. Bob, so I understand the gaps are what? What are we looking at when we see a gap? Is that an area of the brain that's it's still there, obviously, because it's physically there. It's just not got electrons going through it or something like that. Right. There is no activity going on in that part of the brain. Okay. And so the brain has this really unique ability to kind of rev up and then scale down, uh, especially in an area that's not being used. Mm -hmm. You know, you can call it pruning, but it's not it's not turned off. It's not cut off. It's just not going. Yeah. And um, and we see this happen after after inactivity. So that's what this math one would be. And if you let me grow to be. 80 and I still didn't have any reason to open up and use those cells. Now that hole would be about that size. Okay. So it'll recruit friends over time. Yeah. But if you ask me to do long division and you did something really naughty, like put me in jail yeah. and say, you don't get out of jail until you get, until you wake this up. I would stay up all night long and I'd wake up those cells and I'd have a, a perfectly beautiful brain scan within 48 hours. Wow. Uh, because brains are, flexible that's the beautiful mm -hmm. that's like why we're such advanced mammals is we can really get away with quite a bit now there are some setbacks uh, yeah. uh steve that when you look at uh, a stroke that's um that's not coming back because it's such a big gap. uh that's that tissue is gone yeah okay so it, when you look at a spec scan you have to kind of say oh, is it is it the tissue or is it function and yeah. you can't tell by looking Unless you've got a good history like a stroke. Yeah. Uh, what I think is very interesting is that when you go into animal models and you tie off the area of mm -hmm. the middle cerebral artery mm -hmm. and you make these little rats have a stroke, yeah. um, you can have a third change in which cells die based on how healthy that brain was before that injury. Wow. Um, so here's a 41 year old mm -hmm. and there's a, bunch of polka dots in there, right? Yeah. Uh, like a bunch of holes. Yeah. And he's only 41. Quite what do you good. think did that? Uh, so it's either drugs, alcohol, um, uh, too much sugar, too much carbohydrates, a poor diet, one of those or all of them, I don't know. So close. Yes, it's a very common diagnosis. And I gave this in South Dakota, I said there, but I would say anywhere. Um, and he is a diabetic. Oh, wow. He's only been diabetic for three years. Wow. That damage started long ago when the brain would do things that it wasn't supposed to do and then never get a chance to heal. Yeah. This is another remarkable case. Um, and this one's only 29 years old. She's female. Mm -hmm. And just what, 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 I mean, look at how many, look at how much her brain is gone. Yeah. And some of those, wow. some of those bits of that? some some of those bits are physically gone, and some of it is just inactive at the moment. So some might come back. Yeah, um, she actually died a couple of years later. Oh, okay. So right, um, drug abuse, my guess. Anorexia. <gasps> That's what malnourishment, severe malnourishment, did. Oh my gosh. Oh my. I gosh. mean, if you hadn't told me, I would have said, oh. That's got to be a seizure disorder. 
Yeah. Okay. Like, look at it. There's like yeah. nothing left. I mean, it's totally riddled. Yeah. And um, you know, there's been other anorexics over the years that did a lot better at getting um, getting their um, improvements. But here's three 60 year olds, and I like to point out they all three had um, these were, were preventable problems. Okay. Preventable problems. So the one on the right. And you look at that and say, well. The one on the right's healthy because it's one. all there. Yeah, yeah. Crikey. 60 years old, he got Alzheimer's. Oh. And then sleep apnea. Sleep apnea. Really? Just for not recovering? Yeah. and Because we know when we sleep, the brain puts everything back into its filing cabinets. And, uh, you know, if you don't get a good night's sleep, your learnings don't get cemented and so on. But it's that severe. That's amazing. Yeah. It's actually one of my favorite ones for the teachable moments because people poo poo that snoring has anything. Oh yeah. He snores so bad. He late raises the rafters. I'm like, I cannot outperform oxygen. <laughs> You're holding your breath. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and it's yeah. Brain responds and they, they really do have a, a, just a critical tipping point. I think now I'm going to go to another, I'm going to slide down because I think I go into yeah. another, um, I go into hippocampus here, which you're going to like, but you'll really love this. So I'll go, you can cut that out if you want to later. <laughs> All right. So I like to, to, to use these because even my, even my youth pastors can focus through this. So what do you think is wrong with that brain on the, am I, am I sharing? Not yet, but. Still? No. Oh, shoot. Okay. Let me try again. Sorry, I, didn't, no I didn't mean to stop sharing. No Here we go. All right. So can you see it now? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to guess this one's aimed at me. Is this alcohol? Uh, well, so what do you think? Just tell me what you see in that brain on the right. So the one on the right, has got this massive big hole, which I'm going to guess is unrepairable. So that's gone because it's not the smaller holes we looked on the first image. So this is just a, a, an area of the brain that's just completely inactive. Yeah, it's actually a recent concussion from a baseball. Oh, okay. So the tissue is still all there. Okay. Uh, it happened about six months prior. And um, just like when kids are asked about this uh, issue, you know, concussions, I don't know about your world, but in America, yeah. the amount of uh, information about concussions, every kid knows this rule. Yeah. And so the baseball hits in that affects one side of the brain, um, but then it it pushes that brain to squish against the other side and we call it the coup, counter, counter coup um, damages. So, mm -hmm. uh, and when you ask kids about concussions, um, I have them do this. So it's a great little experiment. And the next time that you have a, um, <laughs> you have a uh, request from one of your kids that they need like, I don't know, we would call it junior achievement days. Like what does daddy do during the day? Yeah. Or you get the short straw for running youth group. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. would highly encourage you to do this. Okay. And the place you start is <laughs> you say, all right, everybody stand up if you've had a concussion. Mm -hmm. And um, then you say, now you get to sit down when you tell me one symptom. Okay. So and usually slurred speech, slurred, uh, blurred yep. vision. Uh, I can't remember what, what happened in the minute leading up to it. What else? I, yep. I feel sick sometimes. Yeah, if I've had a big blow, I used to be a bit of boxing. Bit of a blow, feel a bit sick. That's the mm -hmm. main ones I can think of. How about, and then what about, like, did anything happen to, does sound or smells change for you? Uh, not me personally, but I guess that could be, I've heard people say that. Yep, yep. Like the bright lights really hurt there, make them have a headache or the sound is really annoying to them. Yeah. So they're very sensitive to light and to sound. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, some other things I have, if, if I get through that wave and I haven't got all the things on my list yet, I, t I then say, now the rest of you stand up and you've all been around people or heard about people who've had a concussion. Mm -hmm. What else did you notice about somebody who has a concussion? Yeah. And this is where they'll talk about things like, well, their eyes got funny or um, they threw up or they passed out. And then I say, well, can you die from a concussion? I and guess. the answer is yes. How, so how do you, how do you die? Oh, don't know. Maybe the answer is no. Now I, I, you've lost me. 
Yeah. So you you were going to get to that in just a second. So I, I tell about this this kid yeah. who was one of my the boy that you met. He this was when he was eleven, and he's kid number three, early middle school. Oh, this this is a picture of your super own. Super smart. This, this, let me get this right. This is your own son's brain. Nope. This is his friend. Oh, his friend. Okay. Sorry. Okay. But somebody you know. Okay. Yep. Yeah, 11 years old. Okay. And he uh, was um, playing, um, he was son number three, um, and he was out for, you know, doing his sports and stuff. Mm -hmm. And mom said, something is wrong. It's just something is wrong with him. He, he, he stopped doing his homework. I can't quite figure out what... Um, why he's so emotional. A couple of times I had to drive to the school because the nurse calls and says, he's just sobbing. Mm -hmm. And I go in and I'm in the nurse's room and I comfort him and the crying stops. Mm -hmm. And it's like he shakes it off and then wants to go back to class. Yeah. And of course I'm like, okay, I've taken him to psychiatry. I've taken him to neurology. I've taken him to his pediatrician. I've taken him to endocrine. They don't find a thing. And I said, and it, it, the other thing she said is he's also had a headache for about three months. Oh, okay. And so this kind of scan, they have they have more money than sense sometimes this family does. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the scan, you had to fly to a different state to get it done. Mm -hmm. So I said, you should just go have one of these things done because something's wrong. That's not normal. And um, you've done every test that I have the privilege of doing. Um, so a spec scan was done. And when the dad and mom walked in, uh, or when the doctor walked in, um, first of all, I like to point out there's mm -hmm. the injury. And then I want you to notice there's something in the back there, right? Yeah. So that's, that's the first clue. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, this is what it looked like from the front. And mm -hmm. he had been diagnosed with a mild concussion on the football field. Right. His dad was the coach. Sorry, on the yeah. day that it happened, the day that the accident happened, it was just said, oh, mild concussion. And, yet, and yet the brain scan you're showing us so little in, what, the, in what we've learned in the last yeah. 10 minutes isn't that mild by the looks of it. Right, right. And the sad part is, is that the dad was the coach. This was such a common thing that had happened you know, that they didn't even register it as a, a concussion, like anything to take note. Like they didn't tell anybody that he had had a head injury mm -hmm. he just plays like football he plays football with all of his buddies yeah and he's 11. and so when you look down that place the the you know it's kind of just off center there right mm -hmm. and what the kid had done is he had taken out his hippocampus oh. uh you have two hippocampi but yeah. his hippocampus was offline uh and it was swollen oh. and that family um <laughs> so the, the doctor who did this scan said, well, you're in the same town as Dr. Bosworth. You should just let her, you should just do what she says. Um, and I'll tell you, I had very little patience for the dad who I kept guess. saying, well, yeah. I don't, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he was actually, he was properly scolded. <laughs> I don't like to scold people, but it, it, I said, you know, he was very adamant that I don't raise any, you know, I don't raise any wimps in my family. And he used a much harsher word than that. Uh, we, we play tackle football. And I said, at the age of 11, because if you want this kid in your basement at 30, he's well on his way. Yeah. You had the smartest kid in the class, always did his homework, won every spelling bee. And he's your third kid. He is incredibly social with smarts. Now, that's your golden ticket for not having a kid in your basement. But yeah. you just messed this up by turning off his hippocampus from a head injury that you said was mild. And he's had a headache for six months. If you want this to go away, here's the rules. Uh, yeah. And to talk through what yeah. he, you know, how to get him to do that. It wasn't just, yeah, no screens after five, you know, six o'clock at night in your family until this is over. Yeah. And I mean, everybody in the family, that's including you, dad, Yeah. that your whole family is going to go into a ketogenic state because you can't ask the 11 year old to do it when the rest of the family doesn't. Yeah. Uh, and by golly, he was back to normal in, in four weeks. I mean, Seriously. the beautiful part of an 11 year old brain. Yeah. Uh, fully restored. So, so, so uh, just uh, some uh, other pictures. Uh, just quickly pick up on that. No screens after a certain period because you're trying to make sure he gets a good night's sleep to repair the brain, change mm -hmm. the diet because we need new energy source coming in, the ketones rather than the, the glucose because that's, you know, in many ways, is better for the brain. So, 
if he'd have carried on the normal lifestyle, carried on, you know, social media or whatever at night or watching TV and carried on with a regular diet, that brain would have taken a lot longer to fix or may never have got fixed. But with your support, by changing right. the diet and changing the, the lifestyle of, of the technology, he got better. Yeah, it's incredible how quickly that it works too when, when it's a young injury. And by young, I mean his age and six months is a long time to leave that open. I think it was four, it might have been four months by the time we kind of turned things around and he was back in saying, what am I supposed to do? Uh, but the screens at night uh, really do shut off. Um, I mean, when you get that tight, you know, bright of a light, uh, that melatonin that is supposed to help your brain shut down into a healthy sleep it cannot be produced when the cortisol is high yeah. and light and cortisol go together like um, bacon, bacon and eggs. You just, you're going to have that until you shut off the lights. Yeah. So getting the lights lower in the room, uh, reflective light is what you can have. He can read a book. You cannot have screens. Nobody has television on. Nobody has a computer on. Um, you're trying to heal an injury. This isn't forever. It's until his brain heals. And if you do this right, it's a short sacrifice. And, um, I mean, I said, it really was. Let's do one. Uh, let's do one more brain scan. Sorry to interrupt you. One more brain scan, just so oh, yeah. I can keep going back and watching this when my wife and I sit down with a bottle of wine. And no, let's put it back in the wine cellar. We'll save that for another day. Let's do what happens to the brain when I have a glass of wine. And and, and I'll, I'll recap as well. Two reasons why uh, you might not want to drink as many glasses of wine or whiskey or whatever you, 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 you well first of all beer's off for most people because beer is liquid carbs it's liquid bread you know it's, it, it, so beer's off anyway for most people that are trying to you know uh, be low carb but there's two reasons why we shouldn't be having the wine or the whiskey one is what we're about to see with the brain uh, but the other one of course is every glass i have for that period while the liver is sort of dealing with that i'm not i'm not in ketosis i'm not well i'm certainly not making any ketones but, but put me off again my glass of wine this evening with the, the brain scan. Right. Well, this is how you're going to uh, drive home that lesson when your kids are asking oh, to be the dad Oh, back to this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Right. So you, you've, you, they've successfully put out all of, those, um, all of those symptoms of what it looks like to be uh, have a concussion. And then while this is on the board, um, I ask them to say, now, I want you guys to use your imagination. Okay. Because I'm sure nobody in this room has ever experienced this, but um, I'm, you've watched movies or maybe you've seen some uh, elder family members. I want you to tell me what it's like to either be drunk or hungover. What are the symptoms of being drunk or hungover? Very similar to having concussion is like the conclusion. I think you'd, because yes, dizziness, of course, <laughs> balance problems. Yes, certainly for too many. Poor concentration. Yeah. Confusion, of course, feeling sluggish. Those, so if we go back a step to about 10 minutes ago and you said, what are the symptoms if you've had a blow to the brain and concussion, I've mentioned boxing, things like that, and I mentioned a few of them. I stand up and ask the audience that. That's the list of things they will probably come up with uh, if they've had a, a blow to the brain or, or uh, to the head or, or concussion. And it looks a very, very similar list to having too many glasses of wine or whiskies. Right. So you look at uh, that, that, um, oh, oopsie, I, it advanced before I wanted it to. Yes. Uh, drunk and hungover is what these two are. Okay. Uh, that those symptoms are the exact same thing as for being drunk and hungover. And why do you think that is? What is happening inside? Why are they the same? Is it because the images you've been showing us, the, the, the blow from the baseball bat or the baseball ball or a punch, or in the UK we do a lot of football, not your type of football, but heading the ball, and we're starting to now have classes for the kids where we get rid of the headers to a certain age, and lots of dads are screaming, that's not proper football, why won't my lad heading the ball and all that. Uh, but what you're saying is the effect of alcohol on the brain is similar to the blow to the brain. Correct. So when you're looking at the swelling that happened from that baseball, mm -hmm. um, the energy quickly transmitted into the brain and had to be dispersed and it affected those cells right in front of them. When you look at alcohol, uh, alcohol goes into the brain, goes into the blood, goes it passes the blood brain barrier. And wherever alcohol goes, uh, one molecule of alcohol pulls four molecules of water.
Okay. So it pulls in an energy and a swelling. And have you ever, can you die of too much alcohol? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, how do you die of too much alcohol? What's the cause of death? Well, there's obviously the accidents, the car crashes, uh, uh, the accidents. But uh, if it's the alcohol itself, toxic intoxication yeah, or- drinking too much. Oh, so close. Yeah, so you've heard of alcohol poisoning where you drink yeah. way too much alcohol, all, right? And they have to pump so, your stomach um, out. So that is, yeah, well, and that's if you're lucky. So if you're in my ICU and you get that bonk to your head, um, that extreme swelling uh, will, uh, there's a little foramen magnum at the bottom of the skull where this brain has to uh, fit inside a skull, which doesn't have a door. It just has this one little place. Yeah. And if this brain swells enough, it will push into that little red ring there. Mm -hmm. And there's a nerve that controls your breathing right there. And right. if you pinch that nerve, that's called brain dead. Right. Uh, we, we can't fix that. It's forever gone. Now we are going to talk about organ donation next. Yeah. And, and when you are in my shock trauma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say. So, that so, shock trauma. Yeah, okay, you go, you go ahead. So each alcohol molecule attracts more water and it's, it's the fact that you've got X, four molecules of water to one alcohol molecule, molecule that creates inflammation. Right. So the baseball swelled the brain so quickly that it pushed it into that frame and magnum. Mm -hmm. But if alcohol goes in really quickly, I mean, once it's swallowed, I mean, pumping your stomach just gets whatever's out of your stomach. But once it's in the blood, it is on a trajectory that will swell the brain at a certain rate. And if, you sw if you're in my ICU after a head trauma, I can calculate when there are enough symptoms that, oh my gosh, I should cut off part of the skull to let the swelling go up so that they don't have brain death. We can't oh. fix that. Oh. And indeed, we'll cut the skull off, lay it next to the table and, the, and just say, wait, we'll put it back on in the next another 24 hours when the swelling goes down. But if you're drinking alcohol and the swelling goes into your out into your brain so quickly that you can't, uh, nobody's calculating it. That's mm -hmm. like you're on the floor of a fraternity house or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. They foam and they suffocate wow. because the brain gets pushed into that brain magnum. The cause of death is the same. Yeah, from a head injury uh, and you know toxic in, uh, ingestion of alcohol because of this same brain swelling. And when I um, Look over here. Um, so that, that, so that's, this that, image. that is going to stop me from having the occasional mad night with my mates once every six months where you go, because that's really dangerous. What about the danger of really? just the constant couple of glasses a night? Right. Well, that's what that's what this guy did. OK. Um, am I still sharing? Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So yeah, 37 year old male. What do you think he did? So he's drinking every night, is he? Or yeah, he hasn't got yeah. the, the big impact of the, 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 the big bender and the inflammation. He's, he's just a steady drinker, is he? Yeah. Oops, yeah, I didn't mean to, yeah. is he a heavy drinker of alcohol is what happened to him. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna go back just so you can have that other, this picture. Mm. It is um, heavy drinker of alcohol is what he did. Uh, and, and, but that's young, 37 years old. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the other, one of the other really impressive pictures that I, I show people and I, I walk them through this, th this was the image I was trying to make sure you saw. So I'm going to put mm -hmm. this up here just so you can see that that's drunk. Yeah. And that one's hangover. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, just in case you missed it. Um, but this is the one that I, um, I really like to show and that is, um, when benzodiazepines are uh, used, they are your Xanaxes mm -hmm. and your, um, there are low levels of alcohol every day. Mm -hmm. Valium, Clonopin, Ativan, and they, they are a small smoldering, a swelling of the brain over long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And so you, they're never getting drunk. They're just constantly infusing that chemical into the brain in a way that it cannot repair. Mm -hmm. It cannot do autophagy. It cannot yeah. undo. 
And when you look at the, that, the comparison of chronic benzodiazepine use and chronic alcohol use, the pictures look the same. They, they look like this. They're polka dotted. They're everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it is a, um, I mean, I think it's shocking because this data came out in 1991. I was, you know, yeah. one year out of high school. This is not new news. Yeah. Uh, it is truly that reversing that the brain um, um, and, and watching it repair is truly a, a change in how, how their brains uh, show up on uh, a scan like this. Let me show you this one. So 17 years of alcohol use this guy had. I know these are really grainy, but they were really small. Nice, brilliant. Um, so really rotten looking brain, right? Yeah. But what's remarkable is when you had a year of abstinence. <gasps> so it can what change. What brain was able to do. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, these are the kinds of... Uh, lessons of hope that you, you yeah. put at the end of a talk like this because people are like yeah. oh screw my brain's awful i'm never going to be i'm like no and if you want to do it faster you hang out in ketosis <laughs> most of the time yeah that's how you go from i mean uh, when i look at some of the best cases for improving their brains um before i entered or added the ketogenic diet to my my clinic it would take me, you know, on average six years to get results like that. Wow. And now in a year, I can see what would have taken me, I mean, six years, just think of how many times people fall off the wagon in six years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really, not only is it not fair, it's, it's not likely to stay on the side of um, an improvement. Uh, they're going to fall. And then I mean, look at how long when you fell off the wagon, how long it took for you to get back on it, right? Yeah. And, you know, you know, I, I love how much we know about the brain and how Im Im impressive it is uh, in its repair process. But I think some of the oldies but goodies that when I'm talking to my kids, uh, I like to show them things like this. Yeah. This 15-year-old is a non-drinker. Mm -hmm. And this is a scan that his brain is, while performing a memory task, they mm -hmm. have him under the scan so they can see which one. His buddy is one of the cool kids at school who drinks on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. This test was done on a Wednesday. He's not drunk. What? Four days He's not later. even poor. Yes, oh. this is what it does to a teenage brain. Uh, that process of looking at how little activity is being used during a memory test because he drinks alcohol once a week and the repair for his brain, it does not happen in 48 hours. When you compare a normal brain to an Alzheimer's brain, mm -hmm. and then you compare it to the 15 year old who drinks alcohol, he's worse than my Alzheimer's patient. Oh my life. And I, I think those are the kinds of yeah. images. And then does it all compound as well? So then, does it then compound as well? So if the Alzheimer's, person like my mom who still drinks quite a lot of wine that is probably compounding the issue oh yeah yeah if you're gonna try and help her brain yeah get her to drink ketones that's one step or yeah. mct uh yeah. somehow that those are really helpful but you got to stop swelling it um and and the swelling of a brain uh is very much impacted by alcohol uh very much impacted by marijuana very much impacted by routine high blood sugars yeah and you know it's just that you're gonna notice when i um when the brain swells from a baseball because the you know it's like boom right there's your symptoms yeah and you're probably going to notice you know pretty much what happens with the alcohol or the swelling of a brain with alcohol you you can feel it you can yeah. you know you relax and ah it's a little less intense but the change of energy and swelling from chronically high blood sugars mm -hmm. is so insidious. It is that, you know, frog in the boiling water that doesn't notice the water's boiling around you. How do you not hop out? Yeah. And it's because it changed so slowly that this is just what you're used to. Oh, and no, I just think that's the tragedy. Yeah. Mm hmm. Oh, I've just loved it. I mean, an hour and a half has just gone so, so quickly. Um, this book is amazing. But I ask 
Dr. Boz, ask everybody the same question at the end of a chat. And it could, you can just recap on the things we've already said, but, but, but you can introduce something new if you like. Uh, your top three tips for healthy longevity. Hmm. Um, three things. Hmm. Number one, get married and stay married. Long-term okay. relationships are a, a really important uh, quality of life measurement at the end of life. Mm -hmm. Number two, is sleep well without help. Meaning like when it. you add alcohol or drugs to your sleep, you're not repairing it. Mm -hmm. And I, and number three would be, um, I mean, it'd be a good tie between a ketogenic, uh, I know it'd have to be ketogenic. Yeah. yeah a ketogenic life uh, that you're, you're most of the time in a ketogenic state if you're looking for longevity. Mm. Uh, it's so reparative for the system. And is, and is that because, you know, we've been around for two million years and until junk food came on the scene and, or you might even go back 10,000 years to the start of the agricultural revolution, but even that's only a flip in the page of, you know, if we take the human existence two million years and compare it to a Bible, right. even the last 10,000 years is only the last couple of pages in the Bible. Uh, and I guess the rest of that time we would have been in a ketogenic state. So that's the state we're designed to be in. Is that probably why yeah, that's you know, so important? It's, it's tempting. That's what I think. I, I mean, people have asked me this question. If I'm just standing on, I don't need to show you a study. I just need to say, well, man, it sure makes a lot of sense to me. When I look at patients who, you know, grandmother lived to 100 and used lard and ate eggs and bacon every morning. And everybody chirped at her. Uh, but she was, she had a good noggin all the way to the end. And boy, she did something right. Yeah. Um, and then you watch to see how much of that temptation for living in a high inflammatory state is almost, it's like the privilege of abundance and normal now. Mm -hmm. I, I think we, we over rewarded ourselves with easy food that lasts too long on the shelf and, and now really causes some serious problems in our health when you eat it long term. Yes, I think you're so, so right. And the bit of the puzzle, I think you've helped me with a lot today because we talk a lot about health and, 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 and some people are very, very motivated and they'll just go and do it. Some people, sadly, or most people, they wait for that big event like they've been diagnosed with diabetes or they've just had a heart attack to make the change and it's a bit late then. You would have been bit, uh, And the bit that I think that people will take from what you've shown today are those brain scans and, the, uh, and combine that technical knowledge with what you did beautifully uh, uh, with Grandma Rose, uh, Mary Poppins, uh, and, and all I try and do is encourage people to go and do more and more research. Uh, you've just been fantastic, and thank you, thank you. You, you did it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with one little, yeah, one little dream of mine that I don't know if you keep this in or not, but I'll yeah, tell yeah. you as I come in, I come into medicine from a farm, uh, and. I really try not to lose sight that sometimes the outsider can see things that others can't. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think the gift of being, having that Brazilian woman sit in that seat and tell me I should teach this little support system, which is free. I do it every week for free, just show up. <clears throat> but what has happened in the last 10 or how many years I've been doing this now, seven years of doing that support group is that it is very clear to me that in order to help the number of people re-anchor re into a, an eating pattern and a life that does reverse medical problems, does reverse their age, does increase their longevity and their quality of life, there aren't enough physicians around to do that. Mm -hmm. And I contend you don't need to see a doctor to do this. Mm -hmm. But one of the places that I, I've, I really, um, I hope I can make it work. Uh, and so I would ask you to like pray and uh, come come join us. Is that twice a year I do something that um, that is very intense, and it is I lead people for three weeks a twenty one day metabolic kick is what we call this, mm -hmm. where they immerse into what I would do with you if you were in my clinic. Okay, and I did this for the. I, I'd been meaning to do it for a couple of years, but life got in the way and COVID changed a few things. And then I moved to Florida, but 
we did this for the first time last year in the fall. And it's what the poster was that I presented at that conference mm -hmm. where teaching people how to do an advanced ketogenic diet. Most people aren't like you that love the science and they want to see the data and they want to say, well, how does this work? And when does that, you know, affect this part of the brain and this part of the, they get their eyes gloss over. Uh, and after 10 years of leading people through addiction, when, when people get in the right group of, of the examples of how does this, how does this work? And they copy that. They know, okay, I might not be able to do the best job of this right now, but in these 21 days, I learned, here's what I need to do. Here's what the rules are for repair. Mm -hmm. And here's what my friends and colleagues are, were able to do in those 21 days. Yeah. And so we're in the midst of that right now. We just started week two of the three weeks. And I will just tell you, it gives me such hope that, uh, that you can teach this in a group of 200, three, you know, we, somewhere we have around 200 students in a class where they leave not being addicted to us. Yeah. They leave with these, these lessons about how do you really take a metabolism and push it to the advanced level? Mm -hmm. And then how do you plot that forward for a, a life of repairing? Because yeah. I'm tired of the phone calls that say, doc, my mom has cancer. Can you help me? Yeah. And yeah. I could help my mom because I was walking the story with her. Yeah. And it truly is a love story that if you if you see why I think it's sold so much, it's because yeah, the love for a mother is real. And it's something everybody can relate to that that's what's woven in those pages. I think it, it's very and, it's very warming, but also I love the fact that as a doctor you didn't turn to medicine because your mom had, had enough of the chemo, you turned to nature and mm. and it worked and it's beautiful because all the modern medicines in the world as far as i'm concerned when you talk about chronic illness they just mask the symptoms at best plateau things whereas we say cure the curables prevent the preventables and we can prevent Four out of five hospital beds in the UK, our NHS has had it. I mean, we're in such a mess. That's why our, our conference uh, in, in, in May is called Saving the NHS One Person at a Time. Um, because yeah. four out of those five hospital beds that are occupied every single night have a preventable element. And the preventable element isn't about drugs. It's about lifestyle and dietary interventions and getting the, your kind of message across because you know, if we eat the real foods and we get out and do a bit of exercise and, and now avoid a bit more wine, uh, avoid the, you know, the, the brain knocks, then most things are, you, we can prevent the preventables and cure the curables. You've been an absolute star. I'm going to keep plugging this. And when you do your next 21 days, send me an email and I'll get it out to everybody on, oh, our, yeah. on our subscription list. Yes, because it, it is truly the way that you transform a bunch of people saying, just learn how to do it this way and you will be free. Uh, so that's what we do. That's where I'm going to spend the next uh, next 10 years of my life, at least, is saying, how do I get classrooms of people to do this without me? Well, so any, wish me luck. Anything you want to collaborate on, let me know. And uh, it would be my pleasure. You've been an absolute superstar. Thank you for giving up so much time. <laughs> and that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate being on your show. Oh, you're welcome. That was the absolutely fantastic, the brilliant uh, Dr. Boz. Uh, check her out on the internet. She's truly amazing. We'll try and, when we know about the next 21 day course, uh, let you know about that. But this book, it's not a heavy medical book. We've got loads of those we can talk about another day. This is an emotional book. There's a lot of science in it, but in such plain English that you're, if you're worried about Alzheimer's, if you're worried about cancer, if you're looking at, you know, most, uh, well, all mortality really, this is a great book to go and get. Really hope you enjoy that video. Please do subscribe to the channel and do set notifications and then just go and tell everybody about it. Thank you.